Hey, this is Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I'm Jim Grant, and uh, welcome to our podcast. With me, as usual, Eric Whitehead at the Dials, uh, son Phil Grant, the author and editor of Almost Daily Grants, and the great Evan Lorenz, the deputy editor of Grants. We're all sitting around this conference table and a swell conference table. This is our um, final podcast before vacation. Three of us around this table are going away. Um, Eric, as you know, uh, has had uh, a fair amount of vacation already, and he, anyway, is saving his time. I think I'm correct in this. There. Pyongyang in February, right? Yes. Yeah, that would be for the days in with uh, the swimming pool. Of course, it's an outdoor pool. Right. No water, but it's a sight. It's the best thing in the city of Pyongyang. And so Eric will be here in case you have any questions about uh, what we're up to or why we're up to it. He's, he can be here answer the phones. Answer the phones? Yes. Okay. Well, today we have, uh, we have a lot to talk about. And uh, we're going to uh, talk about, among other things, we are sponsored by uh, the uh, Fall Grants Interest Rate Observer Conference to be held at the Plaza Hotel on October 9th. And this is uh, it's a kind of a sentimental event for us because it's our 35th anniversary celebration event. I think it's, it's not so much a festival, Evan, as it's a conference. It's a, it's a damn festival is what it is. And uh, we have on hand uh, Stan Druckenmiller and we have uh, Jim Bianco and Ed Chancellor, Anthony Deedon, who's coming from Switzerland, Francine McKenna, Craig Moffat, Jace Trennert, and uh, who else I mentioned? Uh, uh, Bill Ackman. Okay, you're wondering, with all of this star power, what might we be considering? Well, some topics might be a requiem for the new normal. By the way, didn't you hate that phrase, new normal? Yeah, it's over. Let's see, the next 35 years, a sneak preview. Now, that's my topic. I will present, having watched 35 years roll by, I will present to you in some detail the next 35 years. Bargains in your future, the Ackman agenda, John Law, who died 200 years ago, lives. Uh, Corrupted accounting, that's Francine McKenna. Uh, Stewardship in an age of excess. Interest rates grow up, self-disrupting central banks. What's on a legend's mind? What else do you think, Evan? Uh, Maybe something about China. Maybe something about Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. (laughs) Right. Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for bearing with us through this commercial message. But we have uh, some very pressing investment topics to discuss today. Evan, please lead it off. That deeply out of favor alternative Bitcoin seems to be striking new lows in uh, investor sentiment. Gold demands the lowest since 2009. And uh, Vanguard seems embarrassed that it had an ETF that had gold in its name. Uh, the Vanguard Precious Metals and Mining Fund is now going to be renamed the Vanguard Global Capital Cycles Fund and broadly reduce its gold exposure. Well, yeah, I, I, I know Jack Bogle didn't do this personally. Uh, Jack and I are pals. But I wouldn't blame Jack if he did this personally. I mean, it's it, it is a mortification. You walk down the street and you know people are whispering, there goes the gold guy. I don't know. It's, but uh, we've been through this before. We uh, find gold bugs. That's who we are. We've been through this before. And we know that when they hate it, they're going to hate it some more. But uh, they stop hating it. And then what's left to do except love it, right? That's the next cycle. Yeah. The funny thing is you can lose twice as much in Bitcoin, but still be more respectable. <laughs> yeah. Ain't that the truth? Well, you know, there's uh, what I have personally underestimated with respect to gold is the is the power of novelty in this day and age of transcendent technological progress. And, uh, you know, the, the selling point for gold is that it is... Uh, is indestructible. That also is rather a bearish point. What you want is less supply. But do do we ever decide whether this uh, discovery of treasure, this uh, legacy from the uh, uh, Russian-Japanese war in 1905, was this legit or was this some sort of... uh... It's still up in the air, but this right here... No, it's under the water. Under the water. Thank you. (laughs) For readers who didn't pay attention, there was an announcement a week or two ago, picked up by, amongst other things, the UK's Telegraph paper, saying that off the coast of Korea was discovered a Russian warship carrying, what was it? 130 billion worth. $130 billion worth of gold that was sunk during the Russo-Japanese War. A Korean company claimed to have discovered it, said all the gold was there. Turned out the company was a Korean crypto company. They then started marketing a Korean crypto gold-backed currency that they were selling it for. The authorities in Korea did not seem to um, believe them, have restricted the CEO from traveling, and are now <laughs> investigating the matter themselves. Um, so there, there may or may not be gold, but there is a cryptocurrency. <laughs> that much I'm sure about. There, There is one of those. Well, you know, uh, the very history of gold, you know, says uh, proverbially one says uh, 3,000 years that never traded zero. We can't know that, but we can presume that. This very history seems to uh, constitute a, a reason not to pay attention because it's, you know, it's legacy. It's, it's that thing which they, the clever people, will disrupt, except A, they won't, and B, what would you rather own? 
Evan. Well, if uh, I take gold over the um, hypothetical Korean <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> oh, the one with the uh, guys who can't get their passports back? Yeah. Yeah, that one. All right. So, um, so much for um, the world of monetary affairs, or at least a little bit. I want to introduce an item of discussion. Uh, this, uh, thanks to a submission by, uh, by our good friend uh, Biff Robillard, who lives in, in or near and works in or around Minneapolis. Biff is a, a student of uh, finance and uh, a technician, by I think by uh, certification, but an all-around thinker about markets. It's a relic from October 2007. And if you weren't around for October 2007, it was some swell time. It was on the eve of the Great Recession. Great if you were short, not so great otherwise. But this particular item, an essay or a research note, as we call it today, published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and the headline is the yield curve. It says, does this item that uh, whereas very flat yield curves uh, auger recessions, the previous two, and there have been many more uh, recessions that uh, very flat or negative yield curves have preceded and flagged. The hopeful thing this time around, mind you, this is October 2007, was that the curve was becoming steeper, uh, thereby indicating, then they weren't dogmatic about it, but certainly indicating that the coast was macroeconomically clear. Evan, what happened later in 2007? This is a test. Ah, uh, 2007. Um, would that be uh, the start of the Great Recession? Yes, yes. I think the National Bureau of Economic Research designated December as the cycle peak. And, That's when the cycle did go poof. Yeah, poof. Yeah, the cycle, boom went boom in December. And um, so uh, so Biff's note accompanying this was whenever the next time somebody uh, starts uh, maundering about the yield curve or theorizing about the yield curve and, and giving you his or her recession prediction owing to the real curve or alternatively his or her prediction of uh, the next boom thanks to a steepening yield curve, please do introduce this item of evidence, which you will. The yield curve, like every other surefire indicator, is surefire until you apply it to a margin account. I would say. That's the rule. All right. Now that I'm on a roll here, I would like to introduce another topic. From time to time, readers say, they say, you know, Jim, what are you reading? Which is a good question because you can't say nothing because that, you know, that you sound like some, uh, you know, uh, dysfunctional high school student, right? right? If you're not reading anything. Besides, in New York City, you take the subway. What are you going to do? Like, uh, well, people watching to be sure, but you can't do that all the time. You're going to get arrested. No, you, you definitely don't want to make eye contact. No, no eye contact. But you can make eye contact with a printed page. And I've got, not suggestions, but I'm, I'm just, just going to answer the question. What are you reading? Okay. So um, Jean Marie Evier. The, uh, the great value investor has made rather a secret of this, but he has published a kind of a memoir. It's a, a short and funny and wise book called uh, kind of the uncommanding title, Value Investing Makes Sense. I've got two books here. One title is worse than the other one, but that John Marie, the worst thing about this book, the only bad thing about it is the title. Next time, check with me. All right. So um, you'll find in this book, for example, a good history of the uh, cycles of value investing. John Marie is straight out of the pages of Graham and Dodd and uh, has the record uh, that actually that shows that you know, distinguished record by a distinguished fine, fine gentleman is John Marie. And um, he uh, relates in this how uh, during the late 1990s, when value investing was out, uh, no one wanted to buy the uh, the division of uh, Societe Generale where he worked producing excellent results, though not tech boom results, tech bubble results. And he describes how uh, the big dumb bank had to get rid of this uh, very solid investment subsidiary and how people who wanted it couldn't afford it because they too were getting redeemed. And Marty Whitman at uh, Third Avenue Value Fund wanted to buy Jean Marie's division, but he couldn't because his fund too was under the siege of impatient investors. So it describes how... Um, at length, uh, Arnhold and S. Bleischroder bought it, and uh, the rest is uh, was very lucrative history. But uh, there are many such stories in here, and it gives you a, a sense of uh, of the cycles of investment uh, excitement and fads, enthusiasms, and the absence of enthusiasm. And uh, here's a, a characteristic touch of Jean Marie's uh, wry Gallic sense of humor. He said uh, that uh, some friends of his uh, at First Eagle Investment Management, the name of his firm, and uh, at the Columbia Business School, uh, teamed up to endow a chair in, now I'm quoting him, in my name at Columbia B School. Therefore, said Jean Marie, I am now immortal. Sweet. So thank you, Jean Marie. Uh, the second book I am going to plug uh, has a title, if possible, even more somnolent than Jean Marie's. The title is Finance and Philosophy. <clears throat> but the title does this book no justice. It's by Alex J. Pollock, who uh, 
practices our street think tank in Washington. And uh, Alex had a very, very distinguished career as a practitioner in finance. And then he's now in the business of thinking about it. And he's written a book, the subtitle of which is quite good, which is Why We're Always Surprised. Now, uh, this book is to be released, I think, in uh, October or September. So you have to pre-order it, I guess, from Amazon. The publisher is Paul Dry Books, D-R-Y. But the book is not dry. And I'm going to read you one short paragraph, one short and illuminating paragraph on the topic of liquidity. Evan, you remember the uh, Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago had the thing on uh, how liquidity is drying up in the bond. Remember this film? Yes, it's yes, drying yes, up yes. in the bond market. Right. So they didn't define liquidity. The very word liquidity connotes something physical, right? It's like a waterfall, right? Well, I think they tried to as a uh, bid ask spreads was, was I think, the, yeah. the, 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 their stab. But there's it. another way to approach it, and I think a, a much more satisfactory way, and it's not exactly bid ask spreads, nor is it. Uh, uh, what you think of when you hear the word liquid, like, you know, that's like the opposite of what viscous. So it's, it's, not, it's not like molasses. It's like a, a gurgling brook. No, it's not that. It's not, it's not physical. Here is the author, Alex Pollock, on liquidity. In short, he says, quote, liquidity is about group behavior and group belief in the solvency of counterparties and the reliability of prices. When no one is sure who is broke and there is high uncertainty about whether prices are meaningful, we will discover that liquidity has vanished, however plentiful it might have been shortly before. So liquidity to me, I mean, this is me now, not uh, Alex. I think he would not disagree. Liqu liquidity is always a phantom, right? If it's there, it's, it's an expression of, of uh, as they used to say, man's confidence in man, man's faith in man. Well, it's not there. It's just people you know, pulling back and, and not trusting. So it's not as if, it's like when, you know, it's like when people say a bear market starts when it's down 20%. Yes, it's a definition or it's a rule of thumb, but it doesn't really help you understand what is going on in the bear market. A bear market is not about a, a level. It's about a state of mind. So those are two books. There's a third book. You'll be happy to know, those of you who can't get enough. And I have uh, Ben Thompson to thank. Ben is a paid up subscriber in Columbus, Ohio. He uh, not only informed me about uh, this book, uh, the title of which I'm going to get around to in just a minute. I can't be rushed on these things, but Ben also presented me with a copy. So thank you, Ben. So the title is The Infidel and the Professor. And this is a narrative account by Dennis Rasmussen of uh, the history between uh, David Hume and Adam Smith, two great Scots philosophers of the 18th century. And it's by the, uh, comes out of the Princeton University Press published last year. And uh, uh, I'm midway through it. And uh, you ought to be too. It, uh, Hume uh, does not get his props as a monetary theorist. He was the guy who uh, kind of thought up the protocols, the unwritten dynamics by which the gold standard actually worked. Uh, why, you know, gold didn't pile up in one country and stay there. Anyway, very well done very easy to read and very pleasing. So those are uh, uh, three books uh, with, uh, with one excellent title and one good subtitle. One of the biggest drivers for commodities and emerging markets has always been China. And in 2017 and for the first half of this year, it seemed like China was trying to control its credit impulse. But we've been observing kind of a slowdown. Now, what is a credit impulse? They lend like crazy, but they lend a little less crazy. <laughs> it's just a little, little more. Thank you for that yeah. clarification, Evan. Okay. So, so instead of flooding the the, the, the the markets with money, they just drizzle the, the, the markets with money. Like a, like a salad dressing. Yeah, like a salad dressing. Well, it does seem like um, with uh, the, the, the trade spats with the U.S., with slow downs inside China that the authorities in power are starting to blink. This is a tweet from uh, Ann Stevenson Yang. The PBOC is now telling shadow financiers verbally to speed up financing. Thing is, you can't have it both ways. Keep money reasonably tight and supply all financing needs. Right. So so the Chinese had been cracking down on the abuse of leverage, which of course was uh, ubiquitous, no? Yeah. yeah. With, with a ratio of bank assets to GDP of 300%, something never before seen in the annals of finance. Of course, they're lending crazily, right? Yeah. Ch China bank assets are like $40 trillion and global GDP is a little less than 80 trillion. It's 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 phenomenally big. Never before seen. Never before seen. Before, right. So uh, yeah, the, the the Chinese stock market is down. The trade stuff is thick. Controversy swirls. Complacency squats. I guess complacency just sits there, right? Complacency doesn't move around much, I think, by definition. So I, I don't know about you. We have, we have one more issue of grants to do, which I am looking forward to because I know it's going to be fabulous. I have that I, on special information. And uh, then we go on vacation, uh, ex except for Eric. And I myself am looking forward just to getting away from this stuff for a while. You can, sometimes you can't stand it. I mean, people preferring, what is it, they want ether instead of gold? What is that ether thing, right? Or Ripple. Bill Clinton's actually speaking at the next Ripple conference, of all people. Is this the, the cryptocurrency Ripple or is it the boxed wine Ripple? I think first one and then the other. Now, I want to thank uh, the personnel around this table, the splendid table today. 
Eric at the Dials and uh, Phil Grant and the great Evan Lorenz. And, uh, and I want to thank also our sponsor, the October 9th Grants Interest Rate Fall Conference, the 35th anniversary of Grants Festival at the Plaza Hotel. You know, uh, you got to be there. Be there, be square. Yeah, I, I, I just think, I think we're going to have to take attendance this time because some people aren't coming or haven't come and ought to be there. So we'll see you at the October 9th event and we will be back on the proverbial air um, as soon as everybody except Eric gets back from a vacation. All right. Sounds good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.